Thank you. Uh, so this is the last topic of uh, the this unit, and this is the chapter five, the integumentary system, which is all about the skin. And today we will talk about the skin and the hypodermis. By the way, hypodermis is not the part of the integumentary system. So if you see the skin, you have epidermis, dermis, and below the dermis, you have hypodermis. So we will talk about these all layers of the skin, epidermis, dermis, hypodermis. And then we'll talk about the skin color. We have different color of the skin. We have the fair, brown, dark, and what determines those colors. So we're gonna talk about the factors which determine our color. Then apart from the skin structure, there is certain keratin layer of the skin extend from the surface of the skin and that becomes appendage of the skin or limbs of the skin. And they are nails. So when the skin stratified squamous extend, it becomes the nail. When the epidermis layer, particularly the stratified squamous epithelium, come up and dead, that is the hair. And then there is certain epithelium which is modified and becomes the gland like sebaceous and sweat gland. Sebaceous gland is oil gland and sweat gland is the sudoriferous gland which makes the sweat. Then we'll talk about some clinical application of the integumentary system that is burn and skin cancer, okay? So let's start. I have posted already the lab section of the integumentary system last night. And that has, I have went over a little bit about the skin background and then oh, I have talked about the slide. There are a lot of slides, but there are very few information. If you go in your homework, there is like 70 or 60 slides, but they are all the feature of only one slide five times. So it is not hard once you do this, section and see the slide like five, six slides together, everything is there. It will not be harder, okay? So let's um, talk about- uh, Is that-, is that, is that oh, Okay, we will have time to talk about the lecture. You are a very equal, I think, coming when you talk. So let's wait till the lecture, let's finish, and then we'll have a whole hour to talk, okay? So skin and hypodermis, Skin is our, the large, our largest organ in the body. This accounts for 7% of body weight. So if you are 150, that means you have almost 10 pounds weight, that is your skin. And this organ is largest because it covers all over your body from head to toe. Divided into two distinct layers, that is called epidermis and dermis. And hypodermis is lies deep to the dermis, which a lot of time does not consider the part of uh, skin, okay? Hypodermis is basically the deep fascia, the, the fascia of the skin, Super, not deep fascia, sorry, superficial fascia, okay? So let's see here is skin, pay attention here. Go over one minute and read all the terminologies. So go this way, you have dermis, here, then upper part epidermis and hypodermis. And then in the skin, you have nervous structure and appendix. So go over, just read those names one time. One minute, spend one minute time and then I will go over it.
Cap. So as I said, skin has two main regions, the layers. Epi means outside, dermis means skin, so outer skin. And then thicker layer, you can see this is the dermis. When you wear the laser, leather jacket, this is all dense irregular connective tissue from here. So epidermis is made up of a kind of epithelial tissue. You know any epithelial tissue is covering of the body, whether it is outer covering or inner covering. So this is outer covering, this is stratified squamous epithelium. In some area, there is highly keratinized, in some area there is less keratinized, but this is keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, you can see. As you remember from the epithelial tissue, none of the epithelial tissue has blood supply. That's why just beneath the epithelial tissue, you need the layer of connective tissue. And that layer here is papillary layer. And any epithelial tissue lies over the one kind of connective tissue. What kind of connective tissue is that? What's kind of, what kind of connective tissue supply nutrition blood to the epithelial tissue? Areolar. Areolar connective tissue, good. So papillary layer is made up of, here on the note, areolar connective tissue. And then the thicker layer, you see reticular layer, which is the part of dermis. It is starting from papillary layer up to the hypodermis. And this is a thick layer, which are made up of another type of connective tissue that is dense irregular connective tissue. Okay. And then the innermost layer here, where lies your skin is hypodermis. Hypodermis is also called superficial fascia. And hypodermis is made up of completely the connective tissue, which is adipose tissue, okay? And a lot of blood vessels. Now inside the, the dermis and epidermis. The dermis, let's see, this is the dermis and dermis layer is this one, but dermis layer have projection, finger like projection, projection. And then from the dermis, epidermis from the top, they interdigitate between them. Are you following me? They interdigitate. So this finger-like projection of the dermis is called dermal papilla, you see? And if you separate, they are like zipper. Epidermis is zipping with the dermis. When you have sometimes like the vesicle, when it's a burn or something, you are developing fluid between these two layers. And that's why this epidermis separate from your skin and you have vesicle. Are you following me what I'm saying? Like when you have sometimes rubbing, continuous rubbing and you form the vesicle or bullae, that is because the mucus with fluid, some of the serous fluid build up here in between these two. So that is dermal papilla. Now in the skin, you have several structure, particularly in the dermis. So dermis has appendage of the skin. Let's talk about first the hair. Hair has the root of the hair, hair root, and then whatever part of the hair is outside the skin is called hair sapped. The root is hold by nerve fibers, you see? That is called sensory nerve or hair follicle. This is the hair follicle and hair follicle is surrounded by sensory nerve. That's why when you pluck the hair, it is painful because it is attached to the nerve fibers. Uh, attached to this hair follicle, you have glands. You see here, nest, like glands attached to it. Those are called whale glands, sebaceous gland. Also attached to the hair follicle, there is another you know, smooth muscle. You see, that is called erector pili muscle. This muscle starts from here. You see, erector pili muscle is attached here to the tendon and then it goes all the way to the dermis. 
Okay. This muscle is involuntary muscle, smooth muscle. It is not you're under control. That's why when you have frightful situation or very cold, what happened? This muscle contract and the hair straight in your skin. You have a goose bump in your skin because of contraction of this muscle, okay? Uh, another structure, you see the coil glands here, that is called eccrine sweat glands. Eccrine sweat gland, you can see here another one, another one. Eccrine sweat glands are tubular glands, they are coiled and they open in the surface. You can see the pores here. This gland is opening all the way and they put uh, sweat on your skin when it is hot and then you evaporate that sweat and you reduce your body temperature when it is hot. Another structure in the dermis, just under the epidermis, you see here, this is the nervous structure and that is Meissner's corpuscles. This is fine touch receptor. So when you touch here, this is the receptor is get activated and you feel the touch. This receptor is attached to the nerve fiber and then ultimately to the nervous system. Another is Pacinian corpuscles. You see there is nerve ending and then nerve ending is covered by layers of connective tissue. Like there is a fiber in the center of onion and then onion layer is around it. This is called Pacinian corpuscles. This is another receptor in the skin. This is pressure receptor, deep touch and pressure receptor, okay? In this side, you can see this is the cut section of the hair follicle and the cut section of the spacious gland or oil gland. Oil glands are on the side of hair follicle. That's why always oil comes through the hair root. And then that's why it makes the hair soft and pliable. That's why the oil produced by sebaceous gland is natural conditioner of our body. Some people has a lot, some people has less. And based on that, you can say my skin is dry skin or soft skin. Then in hypodermis, you can see there is cutaneous vascular plexus and adipose tissue. Later, you're gonna see in epidermis, there is layers of cells, several layers of cells. And we have divided that all layers of cells in six tiny, tiny layers. And that I have gone through in the lab too, okay? Okay, so skin and the hypodermis. Function of the skin, it cushion and insulate deeper organs. So it gives the cushion and insulate your blood vessel, bones, muscle, and other structure. Protects your body from bumps, scratch, cuts, laceration, and all kinds of physical trauma. It protects you from all radiological chemical trauma. So if you have any acid, it will not easily get inside your inner body part. Heat, protect you from heat, cold. Uh, it acts as mini excretory system because when you are sweating, you are excreting extra water, you are excreting urea, you are excreting some sodium chloride. That's why it is tiny excretory system of your body. <clears throat> Sorry. Your skin, based on how much melanin you have in your skin, also screens out UV, ultraviolet rays from the sun and protect your skin from early aging and causing cancer of the skin, okay? Most importantly, skin contains all kinds of receptor because you have a special like Piscinian corpuscles, free nerve endings, hair receptor, uh, Meissner's corpuscles. Those all receptors are in the skin which gives you touch, pain, pressure, vibration, all feature, uh, like the sensation, perception of sensation by these sensory receptors, okay? Okay, epidermis, so, Epidermis are what kind of tissue?
epidermis are made up of what kind of tissue? Stratified squamous. Stratified squamous, good. And in a stratified squamous, the cells are the keratin producing cells, major cells. So there are four main cell types in epidermis because there is several layers of cells, one, two, three, four hundred layers of cells. And the main cells are keratinocytes. They produce keratin and we're gonna talk about where they are. Then another cell is melanocytes. They produce melanin. The third type of cells are Merkel cells. And they are attached to the sensory nerve fibers and they are receptor for touch. Then another cell is called Langerhans cells. Langerhans cells are the phagocytic cells. They are macrophage. They engulf any microorganism or bacteria or foreign particle if they are in the skin somehow, okay? Uh, layers of the epidermis. So let's talk about epidermis now. We have epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. Let's focus on epidermis. So epidermis are several layers, and now we can divide epidermis into five layers, sometimes only four, if the skin is not thick skin. Like if you see the palm of the sole and palm, this is thick skin. But if you see facial skin, that is thin skin. In the thin skin, you will be missing the stratum lucidium. So the, the layers of the epidermis are from the bottom part, from the lower part, from the basal part, we call them basal. Stratum is the layer, so it's stratum basal, stratum germinative, germinativum, stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, stratum lucidium, and stratum corneum. So deeper layer, and outermost layer, okay? To remember uh, this five layers, I have a mnemonics in the note, you see here? It's a funny, California like girls in a string bikini. Can you see here in the note? C means, yes. C means stratum corneum. It goes from top to bottom, okay? From superficial to deep, stratum corneum like stratum lucidium, so everything is lucidium. Girls, stratum granulosum. String, stratum spinosum. And B, stratum basal. Just a mnemonics to remember, okay? So let's see here. This is the epidermis and we have here histological slides. And here is the diagram in the right side, okay? So let's see histology first. As you know, there is dermis. Dermis is made up of dense irregular connective tissue. And then we have a stratified squamous epithelium all the way up to here. And on top, you see some flaky cells. They are keratin layer and some dead cells. And then that is called stratum corneum. Then very thin cell is a stratum granulosum. Then a stratum spinosum, stratum basal here. This is from the thinnest skin, okay? Now, if you see the same thing in the diagram, you see here, dermis, dense regular connective tissue, and then you have stratum basal. So what are the cells in the stratum basal? All the cells here. You have the keratinocytes, These are the keratinocytes, the yellow cells. Then some cells are Merkel cells. Your Merkel cells is attached to the nerve fibers. That's why when you touch your skin, a Merkel cell give the touch feeling to this nerve and text to your brain. Then you have the melanocytes. Melanocytes makes melanin by their rough endoplasmic reticulum. And then by the exocytosis, then it passed to the Keratinocytes, you see, basal keratinocytes. And you see in the basal cells, the keratinocyte, here the diagram, it shows like mitosis. So this is the cell which is dividing all the time and then replacing when they die. Now, 
the keratinocytes, the melanin is going slowly up. You see, these dots, black dots are melanin. So through the keratinocytes, they are coming up, coming up, and then they concentrate on the surface, and then there is dead cells here. And in between keratinocyte, there is some longer hand cells. So you see keratinocytes are here, up all the way here. And then keratinocytes dies, and there is a lot of pigments here. That's why you have a skin, dark skin. And this is the longer hand cells. Okay. So now question comes. The when you go to sunbathing, you can pigment your skin. You can make your skin darker. Why that happens? Because of sun is exposure oxidize whatever melanin you have and makes it even darker. That's why you see the darker skin with the sun exposure, clear? Some people have a lot of melanin in the skin and some have less. Do you think the people who has less or who has darker, uh, the, the lighter skin has less melanocytes? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. No. We all have the same number of melanocytes. So what happens, melanocytes produce melanin and then pass through these cells, you see? Through these keratinocytes. They are the squamous cells, basically. Keratin producing squamous cells. These cells contain enzymes in their lysosomes. And those enzymes metabolize these melanocytes. In some individual, we have a lot of enzymes. In some individual, we have less enzymes. So if you have a lot of enzymes, in that case, these melan uh, melanin pigments are digested on the way by the time it comes, there is few melanin. That's why there is fair skin, not due to the lack of melanocytes. It is due to the amount of enzymes in your keratinocyte cells, okay? Okay, let's talk now dermis, second major layer, uh, major layer of the skin. It is a strong, flexible connective tissue, and this is dense, irregular connective tissue in the deeper layer and areolar connective tissue in the upper. Has two layers, papillary layer includes dermal papilla, areolar, and then reticular layer, which is deeper layer, that is 80% thickness of the dermis. Only 20% layer of the dermis is papillary layer. And they are made up of dense irregular connective tissue. Flexor lines, you see in the palm you have creases, everybody has crease. How many creases you have usually? One, two, three. Anybody has only one? Look at into your creases. If you look into your farm, anybody has one? Nope. If you have one, that is seen only in Down syndrome. Next time when you see a Down syndrome kid, look into your, their palm. There will be one single palmal crease and that's a genetic defect. Okay, so how these crease lines produced in your skin, in your face, in your palm everywhere? The palmistry people, they say, oh, there is all the lines. This determines your luck, your fortune. No, no, they are not. They are just anatomical feature. This is because of attachment of dermis to the hypodermis and to the muscles. So dermis is attached to the hypodermis and to the muscle and the pull. And in the fetal life, we are flex position. That's why it is formed. So it is not any luck associated with it, okay? That's the palmar crease, you can see. This is the flexion crease of the palm, flexion crease of the digit fingers. You can see in the face and everywhere. Hypodermis is deep to the skin, also called superficial fascia. They are contents areolar and adipose connective tissue. 
and they anchor skin to the underlying structure and they help insulate the body because they contain a lot of fat cells. That's why they store energy. Skin color, what determines the skin color? Number one, it is melanin, which determines the skin color. If you produce a lot of metal melanin and you bring a lot to the skin, then you produce color. In some people, so how melanin is produced? Melanin is produced by, <coughs> sorry, melanin is produced by melanocytes. And melanocytes live where? Which layer of the dermis or epidermis? Stratum basal. Stratum basal, yes, it is. It lies in the stratum basal of the dermis layer. So that, produce that cell, melanocytes produce melanin, and they produce melanin from tyrosine amino acid. Tyrosine is an amino acid, okay? And tyrosine is converted by tyrosinase enzyme. So you see here in the note, footnote, tyrosine is converted into melanin by an enzyme called tyrosinase. Can you guys see my note? Yes. Yes. And when you have a genetic defect of tyrosinase enzyme, then what happens? You have no tyrosine enzyme or you have less tyrosine enzyme or you have abnormal tyrosine enzyme. So if you have lack of tyrosine enzyme, can you make melanin from tyrosine? No then what will be your skin? Even you have melanocytes, what will be your skin color? Fear. That's why even brown or black people sometimes is whole skin uh, fear. And that is called albinism, okay? In some individual, you will see that there is only patch of whitish skin in dark individuals. And that is called vitiligo. And vitiligo is not due to deficiency of tyrosinase enzyme. That is because your immune system is killing in some location your own melanocytes. So vitiligo is autoimmune destruction of, uh, destruction of melanocytes by your own immune cells. Are you following me? That is the vitiligo and that is associated with the melanin. Another component of a skin color is carotin. So if you are, let's say, eating a lot of carrots or tomatoes, which contains a lot of carotene, that gives you the alloy coloration, alloy coloration of your skin. And it can be seen only in fair skin color, not in the dark or brown color, because darker color covers the uh, alloy discoloration, okay? Hemoglobin is also, if you have a lot of hemoglobin, that gives you a uh, crimson color to your skin. And that is also only visible in fair skin, okay? Uh, appendages of the skin. So you know what are the appendages of the skin? Appendages of the skins are, what are the appendages of the skin? You have a skin, and in the skin, you have nail, you have hair, and some glands. So let's talk about nail. As I said, nail are scale-like modification of epidermis. So when a stratified squamous epithelium extend outside and become hard keratin, then we call it nails. So take a nail piece and the scratch of the scrap of your upper skin and put it, burn it. They all smell the same way, both of them, because they are made up of dead keratin cells. They are made up of hard keratin. Part of the nail free is body, root, nail force, and eponychium, which is also called cuticle. So if you see here nail, look at here from the superficial view. So this is free edge. This is the body of the nail. This is the nail fold here. And then this is cuticle, the posterior lining. And you see the white area, look into your nail. That is called Nulula. Can you see in the, 
Can you find out new lunula in your skin, uh, in your nail? Look at your nail, everybody, please. In your nail, live. Can you find out the nulula, sorry, lunula? L-U-N-U-L-A. Now, if you give a cut section through the middle and then see from the side, what do you see? You see the free edge of the nail. Then you have nail bed, where lying is the body of the nail. And then it goes back and becomes the nail matrix. Nail matrix is continuation of the stratified squamous of your skin in the nail. See? Stratified is is coming and becomes the nail matrix. And from here, nail is coming. So let's see if you have a cut here or damage of your finger. If you lose this all nail matrix after the damage, you will never develop that nail again. But let's see if you have damage up to here and you have matrix left, it will grow back. Okay? Here, appendage of the skin, another part of the appendage is here. So let's see, here is a flexible stand of dead keratinized cells. So here is also the same thing. Epithelial cells comes outside and becomes keratin and extend out. That's why it is here. So they, they are, and they contains a lot of dark keratin, tough and durable. Chief parts of the hair is root and shaft. Root is inside, embedded in the skin, which you cannot see. And shaft is projected above the skin surface, which you can see. So if you're holding your hair now, that is the shaft of your hair, okay? If you give a cut section of the hair, the main layer are, the central layer of the hair is medulla, then surrounding the medulla is cortex and outside the cortex is cuticle. So let's see here, here is the hair. Here is the sap, everything from here is the root. And now you have a cut section at this layer in the shaft. not in the, sorry, not in the shaft, in the root. So you have a cut section in the root of the hair. So you can see all the layers. Outermost layer here is connective tissue root set, which is connecting your hair shaft to the skin. Next to this is another layer, this layer that is called glassy membrane. Then another major layer is here, this layer. This is called external epithelial root sheath, which is the thicker layer here. Then very thin internal epithelial root sheath. Then you have whitish layer, cuticle, and then you have medulla, okay? For the exam purpose, you are not responsible for these all, but I, I just want you to know this material, how it looks in the hair, if you cut the hair. Only these parts, the center part comes outside the skin in the shaft, okay? So hair follicles extend from the epidermis into the dermis, and there is a bulb of the hair in the bottom. So if you go here, this is the bulb of the hair, bulb here. And inside the bulb, you have hair follicle. And then there is root plexus, which is the sensory nerve around the bulb. That's why when you pluck the hair, it comes, plexus, and that is causing pain. This is the longitudinal section of the base of the follicles, same thing, and all the layers. But again, you are not responsible for these layers of the connective tissue, okay? You see in the hair, you have melanocytes. When you get older, this area is replaced with air and you have less melanocytes and then you start graying. 
appendage of the skin, erector pili muscles. So another appendage of the skin is erector pili muscles. What kind of muscle is that? Skeletal, cardiac, or smooth? Smooth. Smooth, smooth. okay. So now we talked about wall of the hair follicle root seat, external seat, uh, erector pili muscle. This is a bundle of a smooth muscle and hair stand erect when erector pili contracts. So let's see here. We have to go back to see that. So if you have erector pili muscle here, if this muscle contract, if the hair is usually lying down, if it contracts, hair goes up. And that's why when you see fearful, the autonomic nervous system is activated, autonomic nervous system contract a smooth muscle of your skin, and then here goes up, and then it creates the goose bump, okay? Uh, another appendage is civesis gland. It occurs entire body, except palms and soles. So palms and soles do not have civesis gland. CVSS gland, if you divide the glands, do you remember epithelial tissue? And at the end, we did all the epithelial tissues and their gland and their types, subtypes. So CVSS gland or whale gland is simple branch alveolar gland. And they produce secretion by holocrine secretion. That means they make sebum and then bust. And all the sebum comes outside through the wall of the hair, okay? Most are associated with hair follicle. Function of sebum is to collect dirt, soft tints, and lubricate hair and skin. Okay. So you see in the cut section, highly magnified. So you see this is the hair follicle, connective tissue, sheath around it. And you have erector pili muscle here somewhere. And then you see the like bee nest. Yeah, honey bee comb. And then you have sebaceous gland here. So they make, you see the nuclei, dark nuclei of the sebaceous gland and full of fat sebum, they bust and then come here and come to the surface of your hair. This is the section sebaceous gland. Another appendage of the skin is sweat glands. Visualize where was sweat glands in the skin. It was coiled tubes and then coming tubes up. There are two kinds of sweat glands in the skin. Uh, another name for sweat glands is sudoriferous gland. The breast in female is also modified sweat glands, by the way, we're gonna talk about later, okay? Sweat gland produce sweat. And the wall of sweat gland, if you remember it is a stratified cuboidal epithelium, okay? So sweat is, how sweat is produced then? There are blood capillaries. Those capillaries filter through the stratified cuboidal epithelium, mix water and get into the duct and then comes to the skin. So this sweat is 99% water with some salt, particularly sodium chloride. And it also contains about 2% of urea. So urea is excreted from your body only by two methods, through your kidney or through your urine and through your sweat. Urea is the uh, waste product uh, from the breakdown of amino acid, nitrogenous waste, okay? So you see, I said, this is the sections equine sweat gland. This is the transverse section of the sweat gland. Some of them are longitudinal, but mostly a transverse section. See, there is duct, and then there is more than one layer of cuboidal cells. These cells filter blood vessels here and mix sweat and put here, and then this opening goes to the skin, okay? There are two types of sweat glands, eccrine sweat gland and epocrine sweat gland. Eccrine sweat glands are everywhere in the body. Okay, and they are very numerous. They produce just simple sweat. There are a special kind of sweat glands which are found in the 
axillary, anal, or genital region. They produce similar sweat, plus they also produce some fat, put the, some fat in the sweat. And then bacteria in the skin break down that fat and gives special kind of odor. And that sweat from apocrine sweat glands in animal particularly is musky odor and that attracts the meat in animals, okay? That's how it is used. And the smell different from the ecran sweat is only because it has fat and fatty acid, which is broken down after the sweat is released in the skin by bacteria in your skin, okay? Okay, now the, some clinical application of the skin. Clinical application. The most common disease in the skin is burn. What is burn? Burn is caused by difference in, in temperature between your body and the environment. So it can be caused by heat or it can be caused by very cold temperature too, okay? And burn, usually when it comes burn, we see like hot burn. So the burn severity is based on how many layers of, and which layers of the skin has been burned. Based on that, there is first degree burn, second degree burn, and third degree burn. First degree burn is most superficial burn, where only upper epidermis is damaged, only upper epidermis, okay? Uh, then second degree burn. Second degree burn is deeper than the first degree. Apart from epidermis, there is some part of dermis also damaged. And there will be blister formation, vesicle formation, and then it heals with some scar tissue. But first degree burn, like when you are cooking and your pan is very hot and you burn some area and then later it heals, you have no scar. That is first degree burn. Third degree burn consumes whole thickness of your skin and it can go deeper to the skin, to the hypodermis, to the muscle, to the bone, to the internal organ sometimes. That is called third degree burn. So consume thickness of the skin and maybe even deeper. Burn area appears very white, red and blackened. And here you can see, this is the third degree burn. Here you can see this is second degree burn. Okay, sometimes maybe first degree burn some area. Now I have a question. Which degree of burn you think will be most painful? Second degree. Anybody or has third degree? third degree? Second, second degree? Third degree. Third degree, only one second. First degree. First degree. Okay. So Amelia said second degree or first degree? Uh, I say third degree, but I know sometimes it hurts so bad. The first degree is like, on the skin. Who said I second know. degree? <laughs> I did. Shara? The first degree. Oh, Bert. So why do you think second degree will be most painful? Because it reaches the nerves, but once you have third degree, it goes all the way past and will basically tear through and burn those nerves through. Very good. Very good. Yes. Third degree, first degree is painful. Second degree is painful. Third degree is painful. But third degree compared to second degree is less painful. Do you know what? Who is taking pain? Pain is taken by free nerve endings. Yeah, and nerve endings are burnt in third degree. Mm -hmm. That's why it is less painful than second degree burn. But when you will say then what? The people who has burned third degree, they are in a pain. No, they are because some part of the body will have 
second degree burn, some part will have first degree, and a lot of part of the burn will be third degree. But if you take clear cut third degree and second degree, it will be second degree, which is painful, as Bruton said. That is due to the burning of the nerve fibers, okay? Now, the what is the most important treatment for the burn is giving fluid. When the patient comes to the emergency room with the burn, the patient is severely, severely dehydrated because she has lost all the fluid from the body. So first treatment in emergency room is to give fluid. So in our medical field, it says, what is the treatment of burn? Fluid, fluid, fluid. That is the treatment. You give the fluid. And what fluid we give? We give like normal saline, which is compatible with your plasma, body plasma. So how we give, how much fluid we give? If you give certain amount, if you give more, that will build up in your lungs and can cause pulmonary edema and patient will die of pulmonary edema. If you give less, patient will suffer from hypovolemic shock and patient will die. So you have to calculate the amount of fluid. And that is calculated based on the percentage of the burn. What percentage of the burn and what degree of the burn the patient has suffered from. Okay, so let's see to calculate the amount of fluid needed for a patient treatment in emergency room, we have to identify what percentage of burn the body has suffered and what is the depth of the burn, degree of the burn. Let me tell you one thing. If a patient is third degree burn and 50% body surface area, if a patient is second degree burn and 50% surface area, whom you want to treat first in emergency, let's say there is mass casualty, 100 people in the emergency room, and you want to treat, whom you're going to treat first? The second degree with 50% burn, not the third degree with 50% burn. Because we know third degree with 50% burn patient no matter what you do, it's 99% chance that he or she is gonna die. You cannot save. But second degree burn with 50% chance, 50% uh, burn has more survival rate. So we focus our energy on that patient. That's why it is important to calculate the percentage of burn, okay? So here, this lady is standing and you can see what is the percentage of burn. So total area of the body, has divided into 11 regions and each region is 9% and perineum is 1%. So let's see here. The head region is 9%, anterior head four and a half, posterior head four and a half, 9%. That's the head region. Anterior, upper hand and posterior upper hand, four and a half, four and a half, 9%. This is also 9%. Anterior chest, 9%, anterior abdomen, 9%, posterior chest, 9%, posterior abdomen, 9%. Anterior leg, 9%, anterior leg, 9%, and both posterior leg also 9 and 9%. So how many nine are there? One, two, three, four, four five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, that is 99% plus 1%. I have no idea the private body region has only 1%, why? That is important area. There should be some more percentage. This is important. I think it is based on the survival. Even you have that area, you can survive. That's why they have put the less area, okay? So in the exam, you will see the question. If a 55 year female came to the emergency room, she has a, burn of the anterior abdomen, anterior chest, anterior thigh, anterior left hand, what is the percentage of burn? And you have to calculate. Did you get it? So this is how you're gonna calculate the percentage of burn. And then there is percentage of burn, body surface area times 4 ml amount of fluid given in 24 hours, but I'm not gonna ask you 
what, are, what amount of fluid you need. I'm gonna ask you what percentage of burn certain people has in that case, okay? Skin cancer, there are, skin cancer is common cancer, very common. And most of the skin cancers are benign. That means it does not spread a lot. If you remove it, it goes away. There is basal cell carcinoma. They are the cancer from the squamous cells, keratinocyte producing cells. And they are least malignant and most common. Another cell is the squamous cell carcinoma. They arise from keratinocytes of stratum spinosum. They are slightly invasive than basal cell carcinoma. And most dangerous is melanoma. This is the cancer of melanocytes. This is most dangerous and it causes metastasis. By the time you find melanoma, the cancer has already been spread to other parts of the body like liver, bone, bone marrow, brain. That's why when you have an abnormal melanoma, abnormal like mole in your skin, which is increasing in size, increasing in color, painful, irregular margin, then you suspect that that's a cancer and you go to a doctor and take it out, okay? So here you can see, this is the basal cell carcinoma and slightly in the hair region, the squamous cell carcinoma, slightly angry looking, rough, it goes deep. And you, when you take out, you take like six mm more normal skin. And then melanoma, you can see. See, it is almost six millimeter here. Melanoma. Melanoma is most dangerous and malignant. And when you look at melanoma, we follow the ABCD criteria of melanoma. So what kind of moles are considered melanoma? you look for A, B, C, D, E melanoma. A means a symmetry. Like if you see, if you divide this dark melanoma in half, it will not be symmetrical. One half is one type of color, variegated, and another side is different. There is no equal half. Let's see if you divide this one, it will be pretty much equal in both sides, but this will be asymmetrical. Border, if you see the border, it is a smooth border. Look at the border here, how smooth is here. The border will be irregular. So B for border, C for color. If you see the color, some area will be red, angry looking color. Some area will be whitish, somewhere where area will be slightly black, somewhere area will be very black. And that is called variegated color, different color, various variation in the color. Then diameter, diameter will be more than six millimeter or it has increased from the previous month. And then it has elevated from the skin. These are the ABCD criteria of the melanoma, okay? So this is all about the integumentary system. So we have talked different layers and the epidermis, dermis, hypodermis, and some appendages of the skin and some clinical application, okay? So this is all, I'm gonna stop here and I will go open the question. Oh, again recorded, why? Uh, professor, I have one more question. 